I think we learn best from stories. Um, and so the, I'm gonna tell the story of a, an outbreak that we had in um, our federal prison, one of our federal prisons in West Virginia, that has a TB case rate of 1.5 per 100,000, about a third the national average. The, the facility is a minimum security, medium security facility for men located in a county with 6,900 persons. In 2008, 52 were tested for LTBI, none tested positive. This is a county with no TB experience. The facility A housed about 1,700 inmates, 22% were non-US citizens, and as in, in, is typical in our federal prisons, um, the majority were uh, Mexican born. Prior to this, no cases of TB had ever been diagnosed at this facility. We became aware of this outbreak when we identified that there were two inmates with active TB identified at this facility. That in and of itself was quite unusual. It turned out that they both had the same um, antibiotic resistance patterns, a fairly unusual pattern of low level isoniazid resistance. Um, and turned out to have matching uh, genotype patterns as well. We later learned that this genotype pattern, the Miro 2, was extremely unusual, and only 12 um, individuals had um, that, that pattern in the, in the country. Um, these inmates had been housed in different housing units, which was of concern uh, because um, we were looking at the potential for um, widespread transmission. As a result, we sent in a team of investigators to conduct an on-site investigation, and when we found multiple related cases of TB, we ended up asking for the Centers for Disease Control to provide an epi aid to support us. The role that we played in the central office in this investigation is analogous to the role that you in public health are called on to support your local jail and your state prison when dealing with a, a TB case, particularly one uh, where um, widespread transmission is suspected. In general, correctional facilities just do not have the expertise to uh, stage and construct and uh, develop plans for a contact investigation. So your, your help is needed in terms of directing and supporting the investigation. But also correctional facilities in general are stretched thin from a health services perspective and often um, are not gonna have the staffing that's necessary to do an intensive um, investigation. And finally, data management, which is really quite challenging when you've got hundreds of inmates, many of whom have moved on, and TB data collection is inherently challenging because it's so longitudinal with multiple points in time having to collect data and keep track of it. And so again, public health support with data management is really important. I'm gonna run through this investigation in terms of the contact investigation steps that you would utilize with a case in, your, in one of your facilities. Um, first, obtaining the SOAR case in inmate traffic history. Where were they? Did they take classes? Were they involved in work? Um, and then uh, a chart review, interview of the source patient, defining the infectious period, when was this patient potentially infectious, and touring the exposure sites. So let's take a look at what we learned about this inmate's traffic history. <clears throat> he um, was immediately apprehended after crossing the border by ICE in California in September of 2008. After spending time in an ICE-contracted local jail in California, he was transferred to United States Marshal Service custody, another federal agency, to um, be housed in an Arizona private prison that the Marshal Services contracts for beds. The inmate spent the next five months in that facility. Then briefly, the inmate was what we call in transit with the Marshal Service, in custody in a local jail in Oklahoma and then finally ended up in the custody of the Federal Bureau of Prisons in our Facility A in West Virginia. We learned through inmate records that this inmate had not had any employment in the facility. He did not have any uh, schooling, but this is often something that we would be looking at um, in an investigation of this nature. So let's take a quick look at the chart review. Um, the intake to Facility A has a completely negative TB symptom screen. 
this was a false negative TB symptom screen, and I think is an example of what we found in our study um, in the pretrial facility, that either these questions weren't asked or they were asked in English and the inmates spoke only Spanish. Um, we don't know exactly what happened, but in fact, this was not an accurate screen. Um, on April 15th, a chest X-ray was done showing multifocal airspace disease, left greater than right, with a 19 millimeter PPD. And then a more thorough screen indicated that this inmate had a cough on and off for four months, stating at, with a translator that he had a positive PPD in the past and that he'd been previously treated. At this point, the response was to prescribe azithromycin, prednisone, and albuterol. Now, um, I see shocked looks in the audience. Um, this is the instance where this inmate according to Centers for Disease Control Guidelines, should have been isolated, sputum's obtained, and worked up for tuberculosis. Um, but in fact, this did not happen. Even if this PPD had been zero millimeters, we would still consider TB as a, a, a possible and likely diagnosis in a Mexican inmate with a cough of four months in this chest X-ray presentation. Um, because 25% of inmates with active TB disease will have a, a negative tuberculin skin test. This is an image of the x-ray, which is not terribly impressive, showing infiltrates on the left greater than the right. A week later, he states his cough has decreased, the albuterol and the prednisone has helped, and he um, feels better overall. The chest x-ray remains abnormal. A couple of weeks later, he's seen with a translator saying he is much better, but he still needs to take that inhaler. He's denying fever, weight loss, hemoptysis, and he gets a new inhaler at this point. A few weeks later, again, shortness of breath, says he feels better when he takes those five-day pills, the prednisone. And so they prescribe that again, prednisone and an albuterol inhaler. Um, a CAT scan was reviewed um, at, at the uh, June 11th visit showing abnormal with multifocal areoles of abnormal density throughout both lungs. He in, states at this time that he's still coughing. How we he says that his cough is less than he would first arrived. He's referred for a pulmonary evaluation and considered for bronchoscopy. This is something that I see over and over again, that rather than isolating, obtaining sputums, we end up going for a bronchoscopy when it really is not, not necessary. Um, a couple weeks later, pass again, translated into the Spanish, my asthma is on the rise. Um, finally, on July 1st, we recognize that this may be TB and that his cough has not improved um, and um, sputums are obtained and for drug TB treatment is prescribed. However, another mistake was made at this point. He was not isolated this day. It took until getting the positive AFB smear on July 8th <clears throat> um, to um, isolate the inmate. So I've taken you on this sort of laborious trip through this chart review for a reason, because over and over again in my career, I have been on this journey through a chart where you have a diagnosis of TB and then you look back and you see that over and over again we're treating for an upper respiratory infection, we're treating for asthma, and we're not suspecting TB. And um, I guess it's my kind of strong opinion that it's these diagnostic delays that are most important in terms of, uh, of, of predicting TB transmission in a correctional facility. The next thing in um, terms of the contact investigation steps, a critical step that I often see is uh, not performed is the in inmate interview. Um, we need to interview this inmate for a couple of reasons. Number one, we need to know how long has this guy been symptomatic? And number two, who has he potentially exposed? And merely the data records that you can get from the computer are not going to tell us about this inmate's daily life in that prison. 
Um, on interview, we learned that this inmate was coughing and a new symptom that had not been described before, um, that he was hoarse since November 2008 when he entered the Arizona facility. He also reported that at the Arizona facility that he'd had a 30 pound weight loss. This is really typical of tuberculosis, that you see very profound weight loss. Interestingly, in our facility, we did not see much weight loss, and perhaps it was the, uh, the multiple courses of prednisone that prevented that. Um, but in any case, he reported that he had never been hoarse prior to November 2008 when he entered that Arizona private facility. In this instance, hoarseness strongly suggests the possibility of laryngeal tuberculosis, um, a rare form of TB that is uh, highly infectious, that's spread by singing um, and talking. And this is supported by the fact that the x-ray was in fact not that dramatic, it wasn't cavitary, and yet with the degree of transmission that we ultimately saw, um, um, you, you might have expected a, a worse x-ray. Okay, so the next step in this contact investigation journey is to establish the infectious period. This is recommended for all tuberculosis contact investigations, but is often less important in a household situation where a person has a pretty stable life, they just have household members, they have work. You don't necessarily, plotting it out over time is not as critical. But in a correctional situation, this is absolutely critical because of the inmate movement. Where was this inmate during the time he was potentially infectious? Um, the inmate, um, uh, the, to, the way to establish the infectious period is either 12 weeks before the onset of cough or in the absence of symptoms one, one month previously. So now let's take a look at that um, uh, timeline that we looked at before in terms of the infectious period. And you will see here um, on the onset of cough, whoops, um, is um, in November 2008, when he gets into that Arizona facility. So we go back three months to right before he entered the United States from Mexico, was the beginning of the infectious period. And then it spanned all the way from uh, uh, late August, September 2008 to July 2009, when the inmate was isolated. And we can see here that we had multiple congregate settings that were implicated. Um, a local jail in California, the private prison in Arizona, the local jail in Oklahoma, and our BOP facility. Unfortunately, because of the nature of inmate movement, investigations of the inmates that were in those previous facilities was not feasible. It was feasible to do staff investigations, but um, we will never know uh, how infectious he was, but I suspect he was quite so, particularly during that Arizona stay. Um, so only staff investigations were conducted in those facilities. But the continuation of the interview in terms of where was he and who was he with, who did he spend time with, how did he spend his time. Prior to crossing the border, he lived with his 13-year-old daughter and a wife in Mexico. A really critical part of the inmate interview when the infectious period spans before the incarceration time is about community contacts. And always it's critical to ask particularly, were you in contact with young babies? Were you in contact with HIV infected? Because those individuals are gonna be at highest risk for developing active TB. So in this case, we did recommend that the inmate co contact his wife and ask that she be evaluated in Mexico. While at facility A, um, this inmate was housed in one housing unit only. That was really quite fortunate. Often, because of security reasons, we will move these inmates around to multiple different housing units. Um, so fortunately, we were dealing with only one housing unit um, for this entire time. Um, inmates have a lot of time on their hands and they have daily patterns. And so part of the interview is looking at those daily patterns. So on detailed interview, which incidentally took a couple of interviews to get all this information, we found that he spent a couple of hours a day watching movies in a chapel area. He spent about an hour per day in a music room where you could get headphones and listen to music. And we learned that in that music room, everybody was singing this cacophony of songs. So you'd have all these inmates singing at once in multiple languages and um, 
it was, it's, it's quite, a, quite a theme. And then he also attended a weekly Jehovah's Witness meeting for about an hour a week. The inmate reported no close friends, um, and um, often inmates are unwilling to reveal uh, the names of close friends when, when you do interviews in prison. The next step that is often missed, and I believe is an absolutely critical next step, is touring the exposure sites. This does not require a degree in environmental engineering. This is really just a practical on-site look at what's going on. And I've got to say that every time I have done one of these tours, I have made different decisions about the contact investigation because what I saw tells a story about where air went. Usually it's a good idea to get the HVAC supervisor to come with you so they can tell you where the air goes in the facility. So we toured the A4 housing unit which shared air with an adjacent housing unit, A2. This was a 64 cell um, uh, unit with uh, two man cells, so about 128 um, inmates per um, in the housing unit. There were two tiers of cells stacked on top of each other and a very large recreation area with high, two tier high ceilings high. Um, so a really quite a large airspace compared to some of the other settings we've, we've been involved in. Um, and there was a small card room off the day room, and the inmate had indicated that he did play cards in this room. Um, we also toured the chapel area, which was a lot of low-ceilinged, um, small spaces that um, had the movies and also the Jehovah's Witness meetings. We looked at health services and the dining hall. Um, and um, uh, we also then tried to learn what data was available, like like w were there music room um, head zone sign out lists so we could get a list of the inmates that were in the music room? No. But the Jehovah's Witness meetings, there was a sign out sheet so we were able to, we had a handwritten uh, roster of inmates that had attended the Jehovah's Witness meetings. So we pieced together who, what inmates were knowable. In other investigations, if, if the inmate has workmates or schoolmates, you can often get rosters of the school or the, or the work to take a look at. Okay, so the next sort of series of steps, key steps in a contact investigation are identifying your contacts. And it, uh, what I've found is a tremendous vari variety over the course of my career in terms of the availability of data and the extractability of data. And I suspect that that still exists all over the country. Um, so for example, in an investigation that we did in the state of Maryland about 15 years ago, um, the inmates, um, when they came into a dorm, it was handwritten in pencil and then when the inmate left, it was erased and handwritten again. Totally impossible to reconstruct what inmates were with them. And I suspect in some local jails it's still like that. Um, it, fortunately, in the Bureau of Prisons, we do have good data systems, but we need special programming to pull out who was, who was actually in contact and housing unit contact with that inmate. But always, the first priority are your known HIV-infected contacts. And um, so hopefully your health services staff know who they are, and we get to those individuals first. We screen them for symptoms, screen them with a TST and IGRA and an X-ray. If TB is ruled out, then we treat them presumptively regardless of the TST result. And then other inmate contacts, and including those who have transferred and released, which is another nightmare. Um, and then finally, um, staff contacts. Um, just a comment about staff, it's really challenging um, to target your investigation, but you want to keep the eye on the prize. While you may end up testing a wider circle of staff than those that were known of and had known exposure for political reasons, you want to keep a list of the contacts that we know were exposed and be sure that we test them at baseline and again. Um, at, at 10 to 12 weeks. In terms of the medical evaluation, as I said, so it's the symptom screen, TST or IGRA, and if positive, obtain a chest X-ray. And a step that I repeatedly see missed is HIV testing of contacts. Um, this is a really important thing to do. 
Um, and it's been borne out where um, in, in the MDRTB investigation, the one related case uh, was an inmate who we identified by uh, universally HIV testing the contacts. Um, and um, he was the one person that did develop um, drug resistant tuberculosis. The next step is calculate your infection rates. And you're looking at that by group. So in terms of your housing, and then you often will separate your foreign born from your US born and look at those rates separately. Then looking at the rates with the school, the, the, um, uh, the work, um, the music room, et cetera. And then treating your infected contacts. And in this case, we treated with rifampin for four months because of the underlying isoniazid resistance. A brief look at the results, and um, this got far more complicated than I'm going to present here today, but in the interest of time, I'm just going to focus on case one primarily. So we looked at housing unit A4, which was where this inmate spent most of his time. Of 99 evaluated, 16 or 17 percent became infected. This is a high rate, particularly given that this was a huge airspace that they shared. Interestingly, A2, which was that adjacent housing unit, had a very low conversion rate. So clearly, the transmission through the airways was not a significant thing. We also looked at the housing unit of that second related case that was identified through DNA fingerprinting, and only one of 80 of those were, um, had documented TST conversions. And finally, the religious group, spending about an hour a week, had a 6% um, conversion rate. Um, many of these inmates, 63, had either transferred out to other facilities or gone to um, local health, uh, to local communities, and so these were all referred out. Um, and um, again, this is, it's just a remarkable uh, amount of work to keep track of all these people and, and conduct investigation of this nature. Um, and typically, we don't see staff conversions. This investigation was a little bit unusual in that we did see two conversions among healthcare workers who had one-on-one -on -one close contact. Typically, in a prison or jail setting, staff is not up close and personal with inmates for prolonged periods of time. And so um, uh, it was not surprising that if we were going to see conversions, it would be with the healthcare workers who were in close contact with this inmate. A total of eight related cases were identified, including three culture-confirmed cases and five probable cases who had abnormal x-rays consistent with TB and negative cultures. And just, just a little sense of the social links that went on here. So um, four cases were identified in that A4 housing unit. And the inmate with laryngeal tuberculosis, suspected laryngeal tuberculosis, spent a lot of time in that music room, as did um, another one of those housing unit contacts. Also, the inmate with the matching DNA fingerprint spent a lot of time in the music room, the presumed link um, to, for that case. There was another link that was identified through annual testing on an inmate um, who turned out to be a good friend, um, an associate from DC who'd hung out together in the, in, in the prison setting and done walks together daily. So it was presumed that case three infected case five. And then we had cases um, in um, two other housing units. Again, these individuals were test, uh, identified through annual testing and not as part of the contact investigation, which suggested that there was spread that went beyond the housing unit that was really not determinable uh, unless you were to test the whole facility. And for a brief, a fleeting moment, we considered that possibility because there was clearly transmission had occurred and we couldn't identify all contacts. But that is not a good idea to, to do that widespread testing for a number of reasons. Number one, um, you end up with garbage results, a lot of boosting on tuberculin skin testing that are going to be considered conversions, but in fact they probably are just boosts of previous infection. And also it dilutes the focus. The number one important thing for this prison at this time of true crisis was to treat these cases with their active TB. That was the number one thing. They needed to focus on that. They needed to focus on treating the infected contacts. If we had spread to the 1,700 inmates, it, it just would have been 
completely diluted the focus. So instead, our plan was with annual testing that we would treat people with TST conversions with that rifampin prophylaxis because of the underlying INH resistance in that source case. And we did symptom screening for the next year on inmates that were leaving. So diagnostic delay was critical here. And one thing that I'm finding um, across the country is issues related to radiologic interpretation, that frequently the radiology reports do not mention TB in the differential diagnosis. And in this era when practitioners have a limited experience with TB, um, they may not suspect TB in a, in a, with pneumonia. In another transmission situation recently that we had in another prison, um, the physician was, you know, the patient had pneumonia, um, and even though they'd had a three-month history of costs in, in this situation, did not know to think TB. And so um, we've got a lot of, of, of effort that needs to be taken to get that basic word out to think TB, the CDC uh, poster says. And then if a cough is occurring for greater than two to three weeks, obtain an x-ray. And the next step is if that's abnormal, especially pneumonia, infiltrates, consolidation, cavitation, miliary findings, in the correctional setting, that needs to be presumed to TB to be tuberculosis unless proven otherwise. The inmates need to be isolated and evaluated for treatment. A side note, frequently TB patients do not appear ill. Most of those inmates with the culture negative TB in that outbreak um, were not ill, did not feel ill, but had evidence of TB. And also, just sort of a take home message, often the weight loss is very dramatic and is one of the first things I look for when I hear about a TB case being diagnosed in one of our facilities. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Kendig for new developments. <laughs>